Andy Johnson, Minnesota State University. The title of this presentation is Creating Meaning with Print, a Neurocognitive Approach to Reading Instruction. We are going to start by looking at two common and not complementary models, theoretical models of reading, the phonological processing model and the neurocognitive model. These are two common ones and understanding, they help us understand how the brain creates meaning with print. This is key to designing effective instruction and reading interventions. So let's start with the phonological processing model. This is an outdated view of reading, but it is too common today. It's a bottom-up view that says that reading is simply a matter of looking at the input, the text data. From there, it moves to the thalamus, the relay station in the brain. We process it letter by letter, and it goes up to the cortex. That's a bottom-up view of reading. And according to this model, reading is simply sounding out words. M -a -p. Good readers are good sounder-outers. According to this model, reading is said to involve four sub-processes that happen in an instance. You perceive the words and letters. You put sounds to all the letters in each word. You put individual sounds together to create words, and you put the words together to create ideas. This all happens in an instant, in a millisecond, and magically you are reading, or so it says. According to this model, Reading creates a form of speech in the head with which the reader listens to while reading. This simple view of reading is what James Hoffman calls it. The one-way flow of information. Words on the page hit the eyeballs, go to the thalamus, the relay station in the brain, and then up to the cortex. That's what reading is according to the phonological processing model. According to this model, struggling readers have sounding out word deficits. We want to make them better sounder outers. So, a struggling reader simply needs more sounding out word instructions, or so says the phonological processing model. The goal of reading instruction, according to this model, is to create good sounder outers to have children bark at print, to respond to stimuli. That's what reading instruction should do. But sadly, what happens? With all this sounder outer instruction, students get marginally better at sounding out words in isolation in the short term. You get a little blip, but that blip does not transfer to authentic reading situations, and it does not help students create meaning with print. It does not, it does not enhance their ability to create meaning with print. There is little transfer of these sounder outer skills to authentic reading situations, to reading authentic texts. Yes, I can sound out words there, but I have to read the gosh darn textbook over here. Long term, there's no significant improvement in comprehension in students' ability to create meaning with authentic text in this isolated sounding out word instruction or interventions that often occur. And with this model, theories are used to understand a set of facts, used to help us understand phenomena. But if theories don't account for all the data, they are of little use. And the phonological processing model does not account for some very important data. For example, proficient readers don't look at every word on the page. We only look at 60% of the words on the page. Our brain tricks us into thinking that we're actually looking at each and every word. As well, when we read, our eyes do not move in a straight line from left to right. It's more like hummingbirds going back and forth. And the dot represents where the eyeballs actually landed on, this is eye movement research. And uh, you can see the numbers represent the order in which they landed. One, 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You see how the eyeballs kind of go back and forth, regressions. The, where they stop is called the fixation. The skips are the saccades, and going back is called the regressions. The phonological processing model does not account for that data as well. Proficient readers often insert words that aren't there, but are still semantically or syntactically correct. The boy run down the road, meaning is retained, it's semantically correct. So something's going on besides bottom up. As well, the girl jumped on the bed, a noun for a noun, that's syntactically correct. Something's going on here. And the big thing, almost 10 times more information is flowing from the cortex down to the thalamus than from the thalamus up during the act of reading. For example, we encounter the words on the page, hit the eyeballs, go to the thalamus, go up to the cortex, yes, but almost 10 times more information is flowing down. This is the interactive model, bottom up and top down. And finally, during the act of reading, information that's in the cortex is actually directing the eyeballs where to go. If you're reading about alligators, your eyeballs tend to stop on alligator words. The information in the head is guiding the eyeballs, which words are important. Now, the neural cognitive model does account for this. It's a two-way flow of information. You encounter the data in the text. It goes to the relay station, the thalamus. And from there, three queuing systems are used, not just phonics, but syntax and semantics. And from there, it flows up to the cortex. But here, again, almost 10 times more information is flowing down. According to this model, reading is not simply sounding out words. It's creating meaning with print. The brain is creating meaning. Without meaning, you are not reading. You are simply responding to stimuli. The brain uses not one cueing system, not just phonics, but three semantics, background knowledge, and syntax. And we'll take a little more look on that, pay, on that in just a minute. And the reader uses what is in his or her head to make sense of what's on the page. What is in the head is incredibly important in creating meaning. And that's what reading is, creating meaning with print. Now, the three cueing systems are used to recognize words. That means you see a word in print, it's in your lexicon, and you recognize it. Oh, that's what it is. We use semantics, which is meaning or the context of the sentence. This is the most efficient way to recognize words. The monkey ate a ba. Most of us know it's banana because we're using context quickly and easily. We use syntax, which is grammar, word order, sentence structure. She blanked down the hill. We know that's a verb. We know that's a verb in that sentence. Fish do something in the water. The something, we know that's a noun. We are using grammar and word order and sentence structure to help us create meaning with print. We are not looking at each word. We are not sounding out each individual letter in each individual word that would take up too much space. The phonological or graphophonetic system is sounds and letters. That's the least efficient in terms of space and working memory and time because we can hold seven plus or minus bits of information in short-term memory. And think about it. You could hold seven letters for about 15 seconds seven words or seven ideas. If you're holding seven letters, you don't have a lot of space there to process meaning. That's why if you're just teaching students to look at individual letters to sound out words, you're impeding their ability to create meaning with print. And that's what reading is. A couple of other things. During the act of reading, we use as absolute few letters as possible to recognize words. We don't read letter by letter in a serial fashion. That would take much too long, too much space in working memory. 
we use minimal letter cues to recognize words as we're reading. And as I said, our eyes do not stop on every word. Now think about this. According to the phonological model, you'd, you'd process individual letters. You'd see a word and you'd go, oh, st, 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 stam. Oh, it's a stam. Stamp. Yes, stamp. Stampy? Oh, it's stamped. Yes, it's stamped. Stampede. Ah, stampede. Rather, we don't see individual letters. We see the word holistically within the context of the sentence. The buffalo started to stampede. We are using buffaloes and started, and we just need to just kind of blip on stampede to see that it is a word, to recognize that word while we're reading. And vowels are not very important. All the vowels are removed here except for the initial vowels. We can still create meaning. Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince. He lived in a castle. One day, an evil wizard came and turned him into a frog. So how important are vowels anyway? We can still create meaning without them. So why are we spending so much time on vowels? Now, here's something. I'm going to give you a sentence that's about bears and the woods in which all the consonants are removed. Now, if, if vowels so, are so gosh darn important, you would be able to read that sentence without any consonants at all. But you can't, I would imagine. Now, same sentence with all the vowels removed. Most of us could say, oh, the big black bear ran through the woods or something like that because the consonants and the context and grammar and word order are much more important than individual vowel sounds, which are not very important at all. And I want to give you, some people still say, well, the three queuing system, that's debunked, that's crazy. I'm going to give you some proof. 110 words here. Read the paragraph as quickly as you can. Billy was traveling from Minnesota to California. As he was driving through South Dakota, he stopped at a rest stop to stretch his legs and buy a can of pop. Okay, you get the idea. You don't have to read the whole thing. All right? Now, I ask students to read the same 110 words a second time. Listen what happens. Away drove and car his in jumped could he as fast as ran Billy? These are the same 110 words, but they're backwards. You are deprived of context and syntax. So you're reading individual words, much like a struggling reader. Very, uh, very uh, uh, stop and go types of reading. There's a difference in eye movement, fluency, pace, stumbles and self-corrections because we are not using we're reading like struggling readers who focus just on letters and words instead of context same order deprived of grammar punctuation if reading was simply sounding out words your rate accuracy and fluency would have been the same in both paragraphs but it was not so what are the implications Reading instruction and intervention must include activities that develop all three queuing systems. And I'll show you some of those in just a minute. Reading instruction should be meaningful using real text, not authentic text, to the greatest extent possible. You need to limit. Yes, there needs to be some isolated word study, some of it, but as little as possible. That means students should be using analytical phonics instruction in which they analyze words in the context of a sentence or words in the context of what they're reading to the greatest extent possible. And I will show you in my next video some strategies based on the neurocognitive model.